Hi, good morning. We are on page 8 of the Mystery of History, Volume 4. We finished the little section on Bach, and now we're reading George Friedrich Handel. Okay, he was born in, I'm not sure how you say this, Halle and Der Salle. Sal. Anyway, he was born in Germany in 1685. George Friedrich Handel was a child prodigy. Hmm. A prodigy is a young person who shows extraordinary talent or ability. Handel was exceptional, musically speaking, but his father was not convinced there was any value in this trait, and he wished his son to study law and forbade his son to take music lessons, something that Handel's mother secretly taught him music at night because somehow young Handel learned to master the clavichord and organ. When Handel was only seven or eight years old, a duke overheard him playing so magnificently at the organ that he insisted the boy receive formal training. By the age of 12, Handel wrote his first composition. It was the start of a prosperous career as a Baroque-style composer. Remember, what does Baroque mean? Ornamental. Ornamental. A lot of extra um, ornamental little frills in the music. Um, as a Baroque-style composer that, like many artistic ventures, had its highs and its lows. Handel spent his youth in Germany, but his love for opera inspired him to move to Italy. It was in Italy that opera was first made famous in the early 1600s. In case you didn't know, opera is far more than a musical style. Caleb, do you know what um, <clears throat> opera is? It's where the people sing. It's kind of like, yeah, it's like kind of almost sort of like a play, but they're singing it. Um, <laughs> Yes. It's an art form combining elaborate costuming and scenery with intense drama. If you remember, Bach didn't, didn't care much for opera because he thought it was too worldly. But Handel loved it. Eventually, Handel moved to England permanently and took his love for Italian opera with him. The English adored him for the 40 operas he provided. Loud and rowdy opera houses became the social gathering places of the elite. Fans cheered on their favorite singers or threw oranges at them if they didn't perform well. Yikes. Rude and hateful. Rude and hateful, that's right. Opera singers of that era were particularly admired for how long they could hold a single note without taking an extra breath. Hmm. I wonder if they had contests. Somebody passed out. For this reason, Handel's opera still contains some of the longest notes ever written for vocalists. The English were a finicky crowd, though. What is finicky? I do not know. It means you like something one moment, the next moment you don't. The elite grew weary of Handel's Baroque-style opera, and even the attendance of the commoners declined, partly because they didn't understand Italian, I think that's a little odd because it's hard for me to understand opera no matter what language it's in. I don't, I can barely make out any words. Um, as sales went down, London could not support more than one opera company. This put Handel out of business and left him nearly bankrupt. Who is bankrupt? No money. But Handel, stern as he was plump, that's kind of hateful, was resilient and creative. He found other means of success. In 1770, Handel wrote water music for King George I to enjoy on a cruise down the River Thames. And in 1749, he composed a score for a royal show of fireworks. So he composed some music for the fireworks show. The fireworks display proved to be a disaster when less than half of them went off and the rest exploded with the stage. I pray nobody was on the stage. But the music composed for the event, which was simply titled Music for the Royal Fireworks, is still enjoyed today 
for large ceremonies and public events. Water music is also popular today, though many variations of it exist. Handel's greatest stroke of genius would come when he decided to write oratorios in English. An oratorio is a musical piece, but it has a religious theme. The results were highly rewarding and bought him a great deal of money. The English loved this style of music. Handel composed 20 oratorios, and that still was not enough to satisfy his fans. Because of his fame, Handel was invited to Dublin, which is in Ireland, in 1742. Here's a picture of Handel. Okay. Um, the name of that oratorio was Messiah, often called the Messiah. As mentioned earlier, it contains the famous Hallelujah Chorus. In fact, Kayla, you just sang it as a part of your opera. Thank you, yes. Word spread quickly that Messiah was the best oratorio that Handel had ever produced. 700 tickets were sold for a recital hall that only held 600 people. To accommodate the overflow, flyers were circulated asking women not to wear their large hoop skirts to the performance and asking men not to carry their long sword, their long swords. Today, today's fire marshals would not approve of packing in the extra 100 people. Crowded or not, it would have been spectacular to be in attendance at the first performance of Messiah. According to Handel's servant, Handel hardly ate or slate, slept during his 24 days of composing the masterpiece. In a nearly trance-like state, Ooh. Handel uttered of the experience, I think I did see all heaven before me and the great God himself. Handel obviously poured his heart and soul into Messiah, particularly the Hallelujah Chorus to give honor to the Lord Jesus Christ. Still moving audiences today, it tells the life of Jesus in three parts using both Old and New Testament references. Legend has it that King George II, who was the successor to George I, was so touched by the score that he rose to his feet when he heard it, and everyone in the audience followed, because if the king stands up, everybody stands up. Some say he was just stretching, or that he walked in late, and it was customary for others to stand in the presence of the king. But regardless of why the crowd rose then, they still rise now when hearing the Hallelujah Chorus. It's a stirring piece and considered one of the greatest achievements in sacred music. Years ago, this is Mrs. Hobar speaking, she says, she, I had the privilege of singing the piece in a church choir. Your parents may have done the same. I haven't, but Granny might have. And can tell you firsthand what it's like. Maybe you've performed it yourself but back to Handel. Generally speaking, he was a private man with a dry sense of humor. Not much is known about his personal life and beliefs, except that, like Bach, he signed some of his pieces with the letters SDG, Solo Deo, sorry, Soli Deo Gloria, to give glory to God for his work. Handel also had a bit of a temper. That's kind of a weird transition. Is that the next page? Yes, okay. Handel also had a bit of a temper. On one occasion, he nearly pushed a female singer out of a window for disagreeing with him. A lady, how dare he? Some think Handel never married because he, w he was difficult and his devotion to music was too consuming. It's hard to say. But also like Bach, Handel suffered from poor eyesight and went blind in his later years probably due to eye strain or cataracts. Even without sight, Handel worked up until his death. He died in London in the early hours of April 14th in 1759, eight days after collapsing during a performance of Messiah. Interestingly, collapsing, collapsing means he fell down. He was sick and he fell down. Interestingly, in seeing his death approaching near Easter, Handel hoped he would die on Good Friday. In his words, 
He wished he wished it in the hope of rejoining my sweet Lord and Savior on the day of the resurrection. Pendel was close. His death fell on Saturday, one day before Resurrection Sunday of that year. He was buried with great honor at Westminster Abbey, where more than 3,000 gathered to pay their respects. On a sculpture above his tomb, one can read these words from the Messiah. I know that my Redeemer liveth. What a beautiful testimony from one claiming to have seen a little bit of heaven. Okay, so that was Bach and Handel. And that was 1708 and 1742, I think. Wait a moment, yes. We will move on to the 13 American colonies tomorrow. Um, let's just see. Do we have the little timeline in the front? I don't think we have that huge timeline that she normally has. Oh, yes, we do. Here we go. So the 1700s, we have quite a bit packed in, but all happening around the same time are Bach, Handel, the 13 colonies, the Great Awakening under John Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield. The Great Awakening. Yeah. Frederick II and the Seven Years' War, Voltaire, Jean-Jacques Rousseau of the Enlightenment, Benjamin Franklin, the French and Indian War, Catherine the Great, the American Revolution, and Mozart, and the French Revolution. So all that's going on in the 1700s. All right, we'll pick up there tomorrow. All right, thank you for joining us. We'll read some more tomorrow. Bye.